So I'm actually very excited and happy to see you all here. You know, after two and a half years of pandemic, finally, we have some physical meetings, right? Rather than soon. <laughs> so, uh, well, CVCF is all about, you know, getting all our investors together, right? And do a lot of investor matching. There's a lot of matching going on just next door. But uh, now we have some very good friends here with us to talk about the dating experience. <laughs> so let, let's let's warm up a bit, right? To to understand, uh, you know how how uh, you guys met. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, having this this investment deal, you know, completed is is a happy thing. But apart from you know all this mundane work on finishing the term sheet and getting the numbers right, can you tell us more about your dating process? What actually clicks, right? Can I get started with the investor, Cindy, please? <laughs> okay, I guess ladies first. Um, I think from how we first met Henson, we were actually interested in the sector for a while. So Henson also knows um, we previously tried to date a different startup, but things didn't work out. I guess that's always um, a good lesson. So when we met Henson, we had already met a lot of other co companies in a similar industry. But um, I guess what, what sparked, at least on our end, the first time we met him was that he was... Um, extremely charismatic and able to convey his thoughts of, of how he he's he's very particularly focused on uh, e-commerce and retail and conveyed that to us very well in terms of his logic and why that is uh, versus a lot of his um, other competitors who are kind of doing a little bit of everything so that's one thing that attracted us to him and um, so we've been quite grateful to be able to work with since the very beginning, watching them grow from um, less than 10 people to now moving into a bigger office in Cyberport. Um, so I'd love to hear Henson's thoughts too on how the process of dating us was for him. Please, Henson. So first of all, his view is really fantastic. So I've been knowing Cindy for close to two years. And at that time, we have only like six to seven people. And right now, we have a team of over 100 um, people spread across seven countries. Um, yeah, I mean, and our perspective, uh, as Cindy said, we are very focused, incredibly focused on um, getting our product market fit at that time. So we choose to focus on a niche market. That is actually the retail and the social commerce use case. Um, as a background, so we are a SaaS company that focus on empowering different businesses um, to sell on different messaging and social channels like Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, etc. Right. So we see that use cases could be applied to, let's say, even the banks or even like a service industry. But then we decided to build features that are tailored for retail to start with. And that's why we get uh, incredible traction in the first place and then um, subsequently meet Cindy. And then I think everything goes really well. Uh, in terms of um, having a team uh, from the Gobi Partners team to really support us um, during different phases, giving up the right advice, connection, etc. Uh, it has been um, very my great honor to work with them. Great. And then um, let's get to the most serious business, right? Now you've got the money, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, apart from using the money, right, for your growth, uh, you know, journey, uh, have you actually, uh, you know, made use of your partner's you know, expertise or strain to connections to help the business. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, maybe I start from my side first. Of course, of course, we have been leveraging a lot of network from both the Gobi Partners and Alibaba Entrepreneurs Fund as well. Uh, we have been working closely with uh, a lot of different um, great partners uh, in Hong Kong and across Southeast Asia as well. So I think that is very important for startup um, to work with key partners. Um, for example, we get a lot of business development referrals. Uh, we'll get to uh, work with some tech partners as well, uh, banking partners as well, and also uh, it also. Also, it's a very important foundation for us to raise the next round as well. So in terms of our perspectives, that's very important to have a partner like Obi to work with at the early stage. And Cindy, right? How have you helped them? Um, <laughs> that's a tough question, Eric. So I think um, Gobi, I, I, I realized we hadn't gotten to introduce Gobi. So Gobi is a Pan-Asian venture capital firm. It's actually our 20th year anniversary this year. We'll be celebrating on Monday. Very excited. So um, it's our, our founder actually moved over to uh, KL about 10 years ago, and he's been based in Kuala Lumpur for the past 10 years. So I think part of when Sleek Flow wanted to expand um, into Singapore and Malaysia, we uh, did our best to introduce them to the local partners to assist in setting up local entities there because there's nuances in various countries uh, across Southeast Asia, um, as well as... Uh, 
kind of open, try to open doors for other investors in the region. Since Southeast Asia is also a very close knit network, just like Hong Kong is. Um, so we've been doing our best to be there every step of the way <laughs> and hope to be able to do more in the future. All right. So now, well, hopefully, you know, the pandemic is going away, right? And, uh, and probably investors have some, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, more aggressive expectations, right? So uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you both, right? What do you think, you know, in terms of this particular project, um, your next growth drivers and, uh, well, how, how do you manage investor expectation in it? <laughs> Um, Please. So first, first of all, for us as a SaaS company, right, uh, on day one, since day one, we decided not to just focus on the Hong Kong market. And that's why we have been expanding to uh, countries like Singapore and Malaysia. And after a Series A funding, we're actually even being more even more aggressive, we went into markets like Indonesia, uh, UK, the EMEA regions, and surprisingly, we decided to go to Brazil as well, so in the Latin America. So for us, we think that for our products, the ceiling is quite high. Everyone in the world, different continents are using their messaging and social media tools to try to engage and sell to customers. So I think uh, being very aggressive in terms of hiring, building teams, going to the right markets, finding that market fit, it's very important. So that's one. Uh, second thing is, as a SaaS company, you can't always be just focused on, let's say, uh, one kind of usage. As long as the retail kind of adopt your solution, you start to think about what other features you could potentially sell to them and actually helping them to achieve even higher value. Um, so for ours, we actually um, develop a new features uh, on the payment and commerce side. So as a SaaS company, instead of just having a subscription revenue, we now also have uh, a payment um, GMV cut revenue as well. Um, so we're able to work on a metrics called net revenue retention. Uh, we're able to have a customer paying us 20%, 30% more every single year. So that's why we can get a compound growth even from existing customer base. So yes, acquiring new customers and new markets and expanding the current customers um, spending on our platform will be our key drivers. So are you satisfied with that, Cindy? More than satisfied. I think from our perspective, we're more in the position of a supporting Henson and the team. Um, where we, we, um, we're not here to interfere with any of his business decisions. The reason why we invested in Sleep Flow is because we believe in him. We believe in the team's vision and we believe in their judgment. So uh, we uh, are more than happy with the upcoming roadmap. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, I don't see our uh, chief investment officer Johnny here. We have also invested into Sleek Flow ourselves with our own VC fund, you know, that's the support macro fund. Otherwise, I'll, I'll also get him to talk about <laughs> his expectations. Right. I, I think, uh, I mean, that is a wonderful experience, you know, the dating experience as well as the marriage experience, right? So um, let's, let's give us, you know, you know uh, I think we have many many startups, ma many investors here, right? Uh, I mean, how, how, do you, how do we actually you know, create this, this wonderful experience? Can you, can you share a little bit of tips, right, from both investor and investee perspective, right? Maybe I'll start with Cindy again this time. Sure. I think from our perspective, um, the, the, I guess, secret to a successful dating, to use Eric's words, is um, a long-term relationship built on trust I think there needs to be trust between the investor and the um, and the portfolio company that mutually you always have each other's best interests in mind, especially because as soon as I mean, I'm sure Cyber Report's also on the um, if Johnny was here he would say the same that you are always on the same team and you're really working towards one common goal. So the fact that even though of course we don't sit at Sleep Flow's office every day um, to, to make sure that Hens and the team are are. Um, but we know they're very hard at work. We trust that they are executing um, to their best of everything that they've communicated to us. And oftentimes, to be honest, Sleekflow has more than, maybe Henson is also very good at managing expectations. He has uh, more than exceeded our expectations. Uh, maybe he's also working on under-promising or delivering, but we, th we think that trust building is extremely important. So to find a party that you can trust to go through the ebbs and flows of the of the various cycles with you, whether it's economic cycles or ups and downs in a startup, which is bound to happen. Mm -hmm. 
And on our side, working with Gobi, uh, they were actually our first seed investors. And a lot of people usually ask, as a SaaS company, how do you get your first investors? What's the first milestones um, that you kind of achieve uh, in reaching that? I think in SaaS, people focus on reaching that 1 million annual recurring revenue uh, at the start of your phases. Reaching that is actually incredibly hard, especially when you only have a very limited resources of team. Uh, a couple of people working on the development. Yet, I mean, there are so many kind of temptations because a lot of people can't uh, focus on working on the subscription software. It's because there could be enterprises coming to you, um, paying you a lot of money and then asking you to build very tailored, customized uh, products. But you still have to kind of think about, is it a scalable product or feature? Uh, is this something that you really want to work on? So I think my advice into getting that mar uh, 1 million kind of uh, first kind of um, milestone and getting the first investment is really stay focused on what you want to deliver to your customers uh, and then find the anchor customers that actually give you um, good feedback. Of course, you have to filter it and then work on your products. But I would say in the SaaS companies, um, stay focused and monitor their product development. It's very important. And second thing is really kind of trust your team and hire the best people uh, you can, even at a very early stage. Uh, I think that is uh, one reason why we actually succeed um, in reaching that milestones as well. Um, I'm actually a solo founder, so I don't really have co-founders supporting me uh, in a lot of perspectives. Um, so hiring people and build a process would be very important. Uh, as a SaaS company, you should have a process for sales, um, how to kind of structure your sales team and go after certain bigger customers. How do you structure customer success, um, product development, uh, dividing into different squads, uh, etc. I think having a very kind of good um, foundation will also be very important. So because we just focus on doing that and then um, and then we just kind of um, find the way out, find that product market fit. And then subsequently we met Cindy uh, and they treasure our vision as well. Uh, yes, and that's why I think that's very important to do. Right. I'm so happy for you, Hanson. You know, finding a good partner as Gobi. And Gobi, you know, uh, I want to thank you, thank you too, uh, because uh, you've been a great partner to see uh, Cyberport, you know, and are very active members of our Cyberport Investor Network. And, um, and you know, uh, I think it's important that we don't just uh, match, you know, kind of people that need funds and people have to have funds, but also, you know, matching, you know, their their the kind of uh, I would uh, the belief, you know, the the spirit and and uh, we're so glad that to see you know Gobi, you know, uh, having this trust and giving the, all this autonomy, you know, for Sleek Flow to grow right with with the support you know that you give them. So um, uh, with that, I think uh, we are running out of time, I think. But then we have very, very interesting uh, discussions and sharing. And uh, I, uh, I'm looking at a very bright future, you know, for this a long-term uh, partnership and, and marriage, if I may call it. Right? Uh, you know, and uh, we'll see the next unicorn from Hong Kong very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, our speaker. So please kindly stay with us. We're going to have a good photo together. All right, please look into our photographers. So thank you very much, Eric, for moderating these sessions for us. I think we all learned so much more about the point of view from investor and investee. Thank you. So Hanson and Cindy, please be seated on stage first. And Eric, please stay with us. So we're going to invite the second pair of the panelists. So ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hand together for Mr. Victor Lee, founder of Rise Robotic. Let's welcome Victor. Victor, please. And next we have Mr. Francis Yip, Partners Odyssey Ventures. Let's welcome Francis. Francis, please. All right, so I'll now pass the stage to Eric. Eric, please. So uh, we have another happy couple here, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's warm up a bit as well, right? Just uh, could you share a little bit about, you know, the, you know how, how uh, that, that the matching, went and, and, and what really, uh, I mean, how you guys find a sweet spot, you know, for you to um, be managed, uh, you know, to, to get into this partnership, please. Uh, maybe I'll start from the Victor, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess uh, for this year, um, overall for fundraising, it's really difficult, right? I think all the founders, uh, you know, face the same problem. And so I think fundraising for this year is comes to you know, a little bit of luck and, you know, getting uh, come across the right investor. And so, you know, I use a lot of uh, connection and also connection from my investor, you know, to get in touch with the other investor. So that's how I met with Francis with Odyssey Venture. 
And so we have a pretty good, you know, conversation along the way and during the uh, due diligence process. Um, you know, I think it's all about, you know, getting a, the right relationship. And also, you know, during the due diligence process, um, process get to know about our team, you know, about myself. I think that's, you know, all that matters. And that's how, how we met at the beginning. I, I think just just add on to that. It's a, it's a bit of speed day, isn't it? Because uh, it's actually a referral from my old friend J.P. Morgan. A uh, good friend of mine was saying, "Oh, you you should meet Victor, because seems like he got um, a very interesting business going." And personally, I'm also looking at robotics AI, so that makes sense. Had a coffee in Central. Doesn't really have much expectation. Just trying to see, you know, how we can do what we can do with Victor. How can we help you? But uh, I, I think we clicked in the first chat just in terms of the business direction. Uh, what he needs in terms of support, and just the way that he's conducting the business, the design of the products. So it's kind of all echo with what we believe a venture is supposed to be. So I think from that point on, as Victor mentioned, we've gone through due diligence a few months, seen the team, seen how things are working. I, I think you know, no startup is perfect. So from our perspective, especially coming out from banking environment, is you know, look beyond the business. Can we help them in certain elements? I think the answer is yes. So lucky enough, Victor um, is allowing us to invest in this round. Um, but obviously, our goal is the long term. You know, we're marriage, and hopefully, we can ex help him to expand outside of Hong Kong. And that's the exciting part that we want to be part of. Thanks, Francis. But uh, as I know, Odyssey has has actually invested in a lot of good projects, right? And I'm sure when you kind of a pick, you know, uh, uh, rise report takes and, 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 and kind of uh, evaluate this, this, this potential investment. You must have, you know, compare, you know, to, to your previous uh, investment as well as trying to find, you know, synergistic effects, you know, of, the, of your portfolio companies. Can you share with us, you know, um, you know uh, the, the best practice in, in your trade? How, how do you look for that, that kind of, uh, you know, synergistic effect? Um, I, I think to be honest, in Victor's case, in Rice's case, um, it's probably a little bit less synergistic effect for other portfolio companies we have, only because I think the core focus of what we do is on energy transition so as part of the sustainability mandate. So within this umbrella, obviously Victor, with his problem trying to solve labor shortage issue in Japan, for example, that fit into a subset of what we do. I think it's not so much about having a synergy with other portfolio companies, it's more like it fits into our umbrella mm. of investment now. We look at them on an individual basis. So I, I think from that point, very important for us is, I think two things here. One is we do want to support more Hong Kong startups. As you look at our portfolio companies, mostly driven towards outside of Hong Kong, just from an investment standpoint. I think part of our investment mandate is really to help more Hong Kong startups to go global. And I think the um, reason why we picked Victor, obviously, he's already got a very good track record in Hong Kong, expanding into Japan and looking to Southeast Asia. Again, just given our background, just feel that just from a business development standpoint, we can help him quite substantially. So that is a very key driver, just from an investment decision perspective. And obviously, we have to go through our standard due diligence. But ultimately, we are backing Victor and his team to deliver what he's promising to deliver. Uh, I understand more and more investors are looking for meaningful project, right? Sustainable project, a project that meets the ESG appetite, right? So, um, are, are you, are, uh, do you see any, you know, ESG effect from these investments, or, and also from 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 Victor perspective, are you doing anything, you know, with with, with your product, with your businesses, to create more attractiveness, you know, for potential in, impact investment? Well, I guess for, for our business, ultimately, we're making robots, right? So uh, making robots is all about automation and freeing up people, uh, labor power, you know, to do more, uh, something more valuable. So that's ultimately, you know, why we wanted to uh, create more and more robots for different features. And that's um, what we do. Yeah, no, I agree. I think subset of what the whole ESG mandate is about is Victor's trying to solve a labor shortage issue. It's about efficiency. So from that end, I think uh, he got a very good product just from a design perspective. And obviously, customers says a lot of good things. Customers marketed a lot on behalf of Victor. Um, they kind of vouch on that kind of effect. I think within our portfolio companies, they are more, that's other projects that kind of lend themselves towards a very direct relation into ESG. Anything to do with energy transition, carbon capture, for example, or converting diesel power to, you know, like battery storage. Now, those are very direct ESG related. Victor's case, obviously, is a little bit different because you are dealing with more of a human issue here. Um, so 
not as direct. So again, we, when we evaluate the subsets very differently, but of course there is some effect there when we look, look from an ESG perspective. That is a problem that Victor's company is trying to solve here. So given the economic turmoil that we are you know, experiencing, have you actually adjusted uh, any of your capital strategy? It's, um, I, I think this year is interesting, right? I mean, this, this is the tale of two halves, right, really. I mean, you look, at, look back in you know, beginning of the year with the war happening, Omicron fifth wave, then like, we really did slow down quite a bit at the beginning of the year. Because coming out from the very top end of 2021, when valuation has been quite sky high, everyone is not short of funding, right? Um, coming down to all of a sudden, you have a shock event, mm -hmm. almost like how we were back in 2008. Right. So I, I think we did take a back seat a little bit for a few months, try to figure out where the valuation is, where the econ economies are going to go, regionally speaking, or even just look at Hong Kong. So I, I think we did slow down up until, I'll say, May and June. Things clear up a little bit, and obviously, the city is opening up a bit more. Uh, everyone feels a bit safer with vaccines and all. So the economy changed to better. So we did deploy more from a deal flow perspective, and also a bit more work on speaking to a lot more portfolio companies and also potential investment that we are looking at. So I, I think we accelerate quite a bit for the second half of this year. But again, obviously, with things happening in the short term, that could be a third phase in terms of slowing down to wrap up the year. But I'll say that it's really a, a very distinct two halves that we're looking at here, from very, very slow from an investment standpoint to all of a sudden accelerated. As valuation become clearer, as the direction of business become a little bit clearer. So, Victor, have you done anything, you know, to get prepared for this uh, investment sentiment of the market and anything you can really do, right, to sustain, you know, for your growth? Yeah, of course. You know, I think, you know, the overall year is really difficult, you know, in the capital market, especially um, for early stage startup. Uh, you got to prepare a lot and you also have to be able to show um, your traction, uh, no matter which stages you are. Um, I think in the market condition right now, um, all the startups are building for a new environment, right? A uh, new environment as in, you know, for going forward to the next two years, you know, probably capital are going to be, going to be more and more uh, difficult to get. And so as an early stage startup, I think no matter which stages of startup you are, uh, you should, you know, always look at, you know, profitability or as you call it, uh, margin and all that. And also at the same time, early stage startup, you also have to value uh, growth you know, on itself so that you can show uh, some kind of traction um, to your next stages investor. So I think that's what uh, um, really matters you know, for, for the stages of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. okay. So finally, I want to you know, get your insights and share with the, both the, the kind of the investor or investees, right? Uh, your, your, your tips you know, about the upcoming you know, kind of a uh, investment strategy, right? Uh, and 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 trying, you know, your strategy of getting f extra fundings even in this difficult situation. Maybe I'll start from Francis. I think investment investment strategy standpoint. I, I think just from a franchise standpoint, what we do is again, um, energy transition is a very big theme. It's currently still going to be a very hot topic, right? So I think that trend going to continue. Same thing with robotics and AI. That I think as we coming back out from the pandemic, I think automation will continue to be a key driver of the society going forward. I don't think people are gonna forget what happened over the last three years. So I do feel that the trend is going to continue. But having said that, I, I think regardless of the trend, I think just the key message really to founder is re just, just lose the dream. I know today is pretty hard, just from a funding perspective, but you look back a like, couple of years ago, obviously things are very, very different. I think you know liquidity is always there. But, I mean, liquidity today is still here. I think if you see a lot, of news report, and people will tell you there's a lot of dry powder out there. So I, I think to founder, just don't lose the dream. Obviously, the key fact that the key thing that we are looking at from a Hong Kong startup perspective is, is can your business go outside of Hong Kong? Can you expand outside of Hong Kong? I mean, that we can help you, right? If you are just in Hong Kong, I think for us it's a little bit more tricky. But we are active in terms of business development, but our kind of relationship lends towards a kind of global perspective when we look at a startup. So I think keep dreaming. I think for, for founders, don't lose hope. I think keep thinking about how you can drive business forward outside of Hong Kong and how to make it bigger. But obviously, as Victor mentioned, profitability at some point could be very key mm -hmm. in terms of the assessment and in this current downturn. But I think just keep doing what you're doing and, and I think good things could happen, especially a lot of uh, a venture firm might just want to spend more time in Hong Kong and helping our startups here. So I, I think the market is uh, coming back again. Well, um, for my take, I think, you know, as a startup, you know, focus on um, your users, you know, 
Um, even though now we're in a new environment, I think you know your users, you know the problem of your users will never change. So you know keep focus on that and you know just move forward on that direction. So thank thank you thank you for your sharing. Then um, you know I always have great confidence you know in our startups. You know it is actually in the DNAs of you know our successful startups that they are very very resilient, and then they are ready to adapt you know to the changing market environment. And I'm sure you know with 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 um, you know the trust you know from the the investors and then uh, uh, and and the and the readiness you know to adapt to uh, you know this the changing environment and agility of our startups. Uh, I am I'm still very optimistic, even though everybody is talking about you know another at least you know another one or two years of tough time you know economy. Uh, but then I know there's still a lot of money out there looking for good projects. Uh, I know because many investors are coming to us uh, and asking for you know us to refer good projects in many interesting areas like metaverse and and robotics and AI, big data and many others. So with that, uh, I want to thank you, right, Francis and Victor, for your great sharing today, and uh, I hope that some of you uh, could learn a, a, a few things here, and uh, I. I, I I hope you know everybody continues to enjoy today's uh, forum. Thank you so much.